Hello, I'm Edith Flynn. I'm a professor of criminal justice, Northeastern University in Boston. And we're here today to interview Dan Glazer, who is professor of criminology, so, so sociology, uh, University of California, oh, Los Southern California, Southern California <laughs> Los Angeles. I think we better do that again. Take <laughs> <Jake> two. <laughs> Hello, I'm Edith Flynn, Professor of Criminal Justice, Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, we're here today to interview Dan Glazer, who is a professor of sociology, emeritus, University of Southern California, Los Angeles. Uh, it is a special privilege to be able to be here. I uh, was, uh, Dan, one of uh, many students uh, Dan had at the University of Illinois. And um, I think that was in the late 60s. So it's been a very long time, and it's a special privilege to be talking to him today. Thank you. And I have very pleasant memories of those days. <laughs> yes, it seems like a long time ago. Dan, uh, what I thought we might start with is ask you how you came to be a sociologist, and especially how did you come to focus on criminology? Well, I came to be a sociologist because in the fourth high school that I was enrolled in, in the last semester, I had a course in sociology, and I changed my aspirations from majoring in agriculture to going to Chicago or Wisconsin, where our books came. I was uh, then in the suburb of Philadelphia after living on a farm in New Jersey. and. Uh, I hitchhiked to Pittsburgh to take a test that gave me a scholarship to the University of Chicago. That is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been my, my uh, hobby uh, rather than my work ever since. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, then how did you come to focus on criminology as such? Well, I had a course in social pathology with E.W. Burgess and then I went into the Army and ended up in England, France, and Germany, and just as after the war ended, I was assigned to, I was made a, a warrant officer, having been an enlisted man most of the war, and was made an administrative officer of the legal division of General Clay's headquarters for the military government of Germany, and uh, they brought over a number of American officials including James Bennett, the head of the federal prisons, and Merle Alexander, then a warden, who later became the head, and one or two others. And I used to eat lunch with them, and as we were waiting to go home on points in early 46, and they, uh, I, I mentioned that I was thinking I'd been in Europe but hadn't been able to escape from the Army, and they were recruiting for United Nations jobs, and as soon as they heard that, they had 12 American wardens at that point to mm -hmm. supervise the German prisons in our sector. Uh, they wanted me to come there as an employee for administration of the prisons branch in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a deal just as for re-enlisting in the Army, where you went back on leave and you uh, had a best recuperation and so forth for at home and then came back still in the army and were discharged in Germany to be a military government employee. And that put me, I uh, made me quite involved with prison officials. I first uh, uh, ran the office and uh, compiled statistics and they had me uh, inspecting the uh, Berlin and then the Bremen jails and prisons in our sector, and uh, then we were all moved to Nuremberg in 1948 because the Russians tried to move all the Americans out of Berlin, and they uh, flew everything in uh, to Tempelhof Airport there. And at any rate, I was about to leave after my second year at that, uh, that point, and I had got admitted to University of Geneva to study under Piaget at, uh, under the GI Bill, and they offered me a purely prison inspecting job for the Office of Military Government for Bavaria, 
and so I stayed another year and uh, I inspected 10 prisons, Strafanstalten, and uh, 32 jails, Gerichtsgefängnis. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, then I came home, I had to start the GI Bill before 1950. So in the fall of 49, I came back. By that time, I'd been married in Berlin to an American woman who was working for Anya <laughs> there. And uh, we came back, and I uh, went to back to the University of Chicago to get my third degree from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, though, I had a vested interest in criminology, and one of my professors, Joe Lohman, was head of the parole board under Adley A. Stevenson, and he had refined research, first hiring Lloyd Olin, and then me to improve the parole prediction research mm -hmm. that uh, Burgess had pioneered. So we had uh, work there. We had to interview and apply, write both a case study and apply old actuarial tables to all parole candidates, but we could get theses from updating the research, and I focused on Pontiac, the uh, prison mm -hmm. for young and improvable, as mm -hmm. they called it, uh, sort of a reformatory, they were mm -hmm. part of the penitentiary system. Uh, before we leave that, that early phase of your life, uh, um, do you have any thoughts in terms of uh, Germany at that time? Uh, it, it was the fairly cataclysmic uh, as far yes, as uh, Europe was. was concerned? Well, I had been in Britain, France, and Germany. And uh, when I was in Berlin, the AJS wrote American Journal of Sociology to veterans from all departments asking for articles. So I ended up getting my first publication, as did Ralph Turner and uh, many mm -hmm. other, uh, Arnold Rose, uh, as in the veterans in 1946. And it was an, an analysis of the relationships of the Americans to people in the three countries. And uh, essentially, the relationship in Germany was competitive, it was cooperative. Mm -hmm. The Germans had everything to benefit from collaborating. Mm -hmm. And the Germans were much less impoverished or impaired and much uh, more healthier than the people in France particularly and also in Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas in France and Britain we were in large concentrations competing for the drinks and the women, in Germany we were scattered around and there were lots of, uh, there's a surplus of women, they lost males, and so it was mm -hmm. a great place and uh, <laughs> for a young GI. At any rate, uh, in the process of rebuilding, the the you see the military government closed all the courts, and uh, they were supposed to check which prisoners were Nazis and which yes. were regular criminals. But often the troops liberated everyone, yes. and they gave all the military personnel a translation in English of the uh, German criminal code from 1932 and they were to apply it in military government courts. And then they only slowly opened German courts with, uh, quotes, denazified officials. Right. And, but uh, the military government courts handled any case that involved a United Nations national, like people stealing from the army or DPs mm -hmm. committing crimes. Mm -hmm. And we were gradually uh, and, of course, everybody was uh, economically hard up at the end of the war, and the prisoners were often starving completely. And uh, we had some emergency assistance. Uh, they essentially applied American standards from the Bureau of Prisons to the okay. German jails and tried to enforce them. Like, they, the uh, Bureau of Prisons didn't allow two people in a cell at that time because they thought it promoted homosexuality. So we forced the uh, German jails and prisons that were built for two people to have either one or three <laughs> <laughs> numbers, <laughs> things of this sort. And uh, then by the time I got to Bavaria, they were seeing the end of the occupation. The Bonn government, uh, Bonn constitution for Western Germany came into effect in September 49. And I didn't renew after June. Uh, uh, 
if I could have one of three inspectors were kept with the State Department for liaison, but I want to get back to school. But mm -hmm. at any rate, we, in the last year, were acted, uh, the, pro the prison and jail inspectors were members of a parole board for military government prisoners, and I would interview uh, inmates uh, mm -hmm. sentenced by military government courts, and we'd parole all but the most severe ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, when you went back to Chicago, um, you finished your, uh, you, you got your PhD. Yeah, I had, uh, I needed only one course, uh, one year of coursework because I had uh, got the bachelor's in 39 and then took some coursework and then got drafted in 40, uh, in 1941, oh. but I was placed in 1B because my eyes were then about the same as now, uh, only 2200 without the glasses, but fully corrected. So I went to Nebraska as a teaching assistant. I See. got a, uh, saw something on the bulletin board. I was looking for a job on a Saturday. Uh, I got word of it on a Saturday that I had this teaching assistantship in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, the classes started Tuesday, too, and I was completely on my own to teach introductory. So <laughs> I went there for a year, and they tried to make me a PhD student there, and I took all incompletes and was preparing to go back to Chicago. Yes. But after Pearl Harbor occurred while I was there, and then I joined the Signal Corps on a special program where they waived the 1B and uh, mm -hmm. About six months later, all 1Bs automatically became 1As. Oh, yeah. I know during <laughs> the war, things got, a little, I guess, quite rough for <laughs> just about everybody in, in the country at the time. Yeah. Um, when did you uh, develop the idea you wanted to go into teaching and make academia your life? Right from the beginning. Right from the beginning? Right, uh, right in my senior year of high school, I wanted to be a sociologist, mm -hmm. and I went to Chicago. Uh, I, applied to Chicago and Wisconsin because we had in a high school course a textbook by E.A. Ross from Wisconsin and then we had a readings this Chicago series like the Gold Coast and the Slum, the Gang yes. and the Ghetto and so forth. Those were classics. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, uh, all right, um, once you had your PhD then what happened? Well, uh, I got a job uh, First temporary, but then full time at the University of Illinois. Uh, it was in the middle of this uh, year, in fact. Uh, a fellow named uh, Ellingson, I forget, my predecessor, uh, uh, was a student of Paul Tappan, who was made head of the U.S. Parole Board and right. brought him to that board. I don't know why, I'm very poor on names in my old age. But at any rate, uh, I filled in in the middle of the semester and then stayed. <laughs> you stayed at the University of Illinois? For 14 years, yes. Champaign-Urbana. Right. And, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and in fact, uh, I, I recall you built up a very strong department. I became the chair in 1965, I believe. Yes, that must have been the year I, I had the pleasure to <laughs> come to Illinois. Um, any, do you have any special memories of that time in Illinois in terms of uh, some of the faculty that we well, had? I was saddened to recall my good associate there when I saw his obituary, John Clark, yes. who died. And I, we, I wrote a letter to his widow, and she just got a nice letter back. But he was, uh, we were very close. Uh, before that, though, we had, before Clark, I think he came in 61, we had uh, Ralph England, who uh, left for Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. But uh, Clark and I were particularly close, and uh, we used to drive up often with graduate students to the meetings of the Illinois Academy of Criminology in Chicago. In Chicago yes. And uh, so you got to know each other when mm -hmm. you, they were evening meetings, and we mm -hmm. had a long drive. Uh, I guess it was a good two hours each way. Yeah, uh, John Clark was uh, a very special teacher there yeah, at the time. Right. Uh, I, as far as I know, David Bordewa is still uh, yes, there. Yes, yes. I uh, uh, wasn't as close to him, really, as Clark, mm -hmm. yeah. but though we recruited him as a third criminologist. Uh, 
And I, I do believe we also had someone in symbolic interactionism. Uh, oh, Denson. Yeah, uh, Denson, and a few yes. Others, yeah. And then uh, earlier, I think it was Hewlett. Oh, yes, he was the chair when I came. Oh, was he? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. And I'm still in touch with him he's, and his wife. Uh, he's had strokes and they're both quite ill. Oh, really? Still uh -huh. living in her bed. <laughs> they are? Uh -huh. Very good. Well, uh, all right. Uh, the um, next thing we might want to focus on is um, what happened, um, what made you decide to leave Illinois after all you had built up well, a strong apartment there? <laughs> my uh, daughter graduated from high school and I, uh, both of us were sort of eager to get to a bigger city area <laughs> and I got, I was on a, um, an NIMH board, I guess, reviewing grant requests with a man named Pierce, a lawyer who was head of the uh, Narcotic Addiction Control Commission in yes. New York. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to come and be his research director. Uh -huh. And I didn't like the idea of giving up tenure to go to a political job. And uh, he called back in half an hour and he had a job for me at the State University of New York in Albany. And I thought I want to be where the addicts are, which was New York City. So right. I called, uh, I contacted a few schools there, and I got a tenure appointment at Rutgers with three quarters leave. And I got an 80% appointment with the Narcotics Commission mm -hmm. and lived in New York City. But uh, it was rather frustrating in that role because, uh, you see, they had a large program. They spent a billion dollars, which was a lot of money then in a five-year period, to mm -hmm. give person, addicts convicted of crimes the option of being in a treatment program for uh, five years with only three of them in confinement. Mm -hmm. And they uh, set up institutions. They also subsidized all sorts of other types of uh, narcotics treatment. But at any rate, uh, when our research didn't suggest it was very effective, they didn't want us to publish it. Yes. And yeah. then uh, I uh, was at a meeting in some sort of board with uh, Lamar Empey, whom I knew somewhat, and he was chair at USC then. And uh, uh, they had uh, they needed somebody to teach theory as well as criminology, mm -hmm. and I told him I teach theory uh, too, and. Uh, he recruited me, and uh, it was much uh, we were happier. <laughs> yes, and, and the, that uh, spell Los Angeles. Right. And you've been there ever since. <laughs> ever since, since right. Um, one question with, with regard to your New York uh, research. Did you um, reach any conclusions in terms of um, some answers when it comes to uh, the problem of addiction? It, the problem of narcotics is such a serious yes. one for this country. Well. I got, I hired a few ex-addicts as research assistants, one black and one Puerto Rican, and essentially felt that I was like an anthropologist with, with them as informants yes. in uh, one block on 100th, uh, East 100th Street, where uh, there already was a center that was established by City College. I'm terrible for names, uh, the uh, sociologist Landed, Bernard Landed. Yeah. And uh, so we did a little studies there in which we, uh, of interviewing, and uh, I'd see drugs sold on the street and got a sense, symbolic interaction only, of what was going on. Also, of course, visited the institutions and talked to people and compiled statistics. And I hired uh, Inciardi, who was then a graduate student yes. uh, at NYU, and uh, Dembo, who's now a professor in that, uh, working in that field, uh, also a graduate student then. And uh, well, the sense is that the social uh, support for addiction and the psychological reinforcement on a variable rate basis uh, tends to explain the attraction of drugs to delinquents 
and the biological process, this was almost all heroin in those days, mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, withdrawal symptoms that are only alleviated by more opiates tends to make it uh, compulsive also. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knew that there were many addicted persons among physicians and nurses who... Yes, historically. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, I uh, read Linda Smith's writings and things of this sort, mm -hmm. which uh, persuaded me that we needed a totally different approach. And also this whole problem of uh, victimless crimes uh, poses a great you know, uh, difficulty for enforcement and adjudication. It and, certainly does. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was, I had sort of prejudices, I suppose, in advance from readings, and they were intensified, and some contacts with addicts in the Illinois prisons, but mm -hmm. they were intensified in mm -hmm. that experience. And particularly, if we could publish anything that uh, was realistic about the prospects, I think I got one article there, but it was purely on... On, well, we did some survey reports, but uh, uh, on the interaction, uh, explaining the fact that you had addicted and non-addicted sibling, siblings in the same families on our block. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it could be explained in terms of differential association, yes. essentially, within the family. Uh, Yes. Complementary roles, rather than, and, and of course, also your own theoretical work of differential identification. Yeah, I, which was just applying Bloomer to Southern. <laughs> <in the sense. laughs> yes, but a very, very good fit there. At that time, it seems so. <laughs> well, let me uh, just, uh, just briefly ask you. Uh, uh, I think today the the drug problem is is preoccupying the country. Uh, mm -hmm. It's eating up a lot of resources. Uh, it is uh, disproportionately contributing uh, inmates to our prisons and jails. Uh, would you have any recommendations for the future in terms of what direction we should take? Well, I think we have models in uh, Netherlands and Switzerland particularly, and now in um, much of Western Europe, uh, due to AIDS, they're getting away from a purely punitive approach, and I think we're beginning to see some of that and the greater emphasis on treatment and education. I don't think it's politically feasible and there might be other difficulties in outright legalization. I think the ultimate trend is towards reducing the visibility of the addiction. Uh, of the, uh, th This is what we've done to a much lesser extent with uh, some other vices, like prostitution mm -hmm. and alcohol even. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, limit where it can be sold, and that's what the Dutch do, and mm -hmm. they don't allow any advertising. Mm -hmm. The British don't allow advertising of gambling. Uh, here we see the opposite. Yes. <laughs> 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 but, uh, these vices are, pose similar problems, and it's impossible to uh, use the criminal justice system effectively to prohibit them, as we learned with our uh, yes. 18th Amendment. Yes, and, and also the, the fact that it is just so easily hidden. It's, sure. it's very hard to control human right. vice. Uh, it has right. been so historically. There's no complainant in a victimless crime, so the police mm -hmm. don't know it, except by entrapment. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, well, um, once um, you got to Los Angeles, uh, what was your focus there? Well, uh, I did a variety of uh, research and writing. I collaborated with uh, MP and Mac Klein in uh, two successive training grants, uh, and one had postdocs, and uh, essentially we're, I had one in Illinois also, which was to train people with criminal justice experience to get a PhD. Mm -hmm. And they also had Sal Coburn there, whom I had known since about 45, mm -hmm. who sadly just died a few, a uh, couple months ago. Uh, and he came there on a postdoc 
fellowship after working in the, as an Illinois civil servant with Clifford Shaw in uh -huh. the Chicago area projects and became, got a PhD there. He had worked with a master's degree, but also was a research associate and associate professor. Yeah. And uh, it's been a very congenial department and a good one in criminology and uh, not as prominent in other fields. Mm -hmm. uh, Although it, I think it's rated 15th or 16th in the last tabulation, but it, it's uh, not as high as Illinois or UCLA. Yeah, but yeah, UCLA and, and I think Illinois, is, uh, both of these schools are rated very well. Yeah. Well, um, let me ask you, uh, sort of change the topics a little bit and ask you about uh, something that has evolved since, uh, since you left Illinois, and uh, that is... Um, um, as we know, the European uh, criminologists are more based in law and in medicine, uh, forensic science, and they still pursue that with some mm -hmm. vigor. Uh, to America's uh, credit, uh, we have taken the sociological approach to crime, I think which is, is the more preferable one, but that could be my own prejudice. Uh, but since uh, those early days, let's say the 60s, uh, there has been a um, development uh, of uh, criminal justice, the field of criminal justice. It has grown in leaps and bounds. It, it's been tied to uh, uh, funding from the federal government. And um, somehow the study of criminology in a way has left sociology, sociology departments. So I wanted to ask uh, your, your feelings and your thoughts on the fact that um, criminal justice is no longer part of sociology in many departments. Well, I think that the study of uh, criminal behavior and criminal justice agencies uh, requires an integration of a variety of perspectives. I think the law and even biology is pertinent. Uh, at the USC also in our Social Science Research Institute, we have one of the strongest biological approaches under Sanof Mednik and Adrian Rain and, uh, and uh, uh, Moffitt was with us at yes. uh, Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, and I have, I minored in psychology and, and uh, anthropology, and I have uh, some uh, acceptance of their perspectives as useful. I don't think of them as contradictory but it's complementary yes. and uh, however I had I'm still a symbolic interactionist essentially I think of human beings as creating their worlds by uh, labeling them but starting in childhood they have to learn words to determine what they see and how they understand it according to the concepts that they incorporate and this is basic to all non-reflexive behavior essentially mm -hmm. is interpreted and you interpret you have a conception of yourself and of others and all of this uh, determines what behavior is evoked and what thought processes occur so that uh, I think I'd like to see more basic science in the study of criminal behavior mm -hmm. but I have uh, blended right along a statistical evaluation research approach and an actuarial decision mm -hmm. guidance approach uh, to criminal justice agencies, particularly corrections, where I've worked right. and knew people, uh, with the symbolic interactionist perspective on criminal behavior and its change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think those criminal justice schools that have had good researchers, uh, Rutgers, for example, uh, and others uh, can certainly do, uh, be valuable for evaluative statistical research and also mm -hmm. case studies, but uh, they should, to do good research, they have to have good social scientists. But yes. uh, again, in studying criminal behavior, uh, I would like to see criminologists being from sociology and psychology 
uh, I'm getting their PhDs in those departments because of the prospects they'll be on the forefront of knowledge and thought in those uh, abstract fields and will draw up principles and research methods mm -hmm. that are more tested and more sophisticated from that. But they will apply them, of course, mm -hmm. to the uh, subjects in, that are in the criminal justice area. Well, as, as one of your students, I, I it really did not feel any dissonance at the time between basic and applied. They go hand in hand. Uh, mm. You do uh, basic research and then you find out uh, whether it applies to the real world and uh, you, you check the fit. And if it doesn't, uh, then you go back uh, to the drawing board. Um, the interesting thing is that in some departments, uh, any kind of uh, uh, activity in the applied area was rejected. Um, yes. How do you mm. feel about that? Well, one of the first uh, schools of criminology was at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. it was started by the chief of police there, uh, Volmer, and yes. uh, it was rejected finally as not fitting the UC Berkeley image of a center for the advancement of pure uh, science and the top uh, rival of Harvard for top place. And uh, I think that uh, that reflects, uh, that was the epitome of this kind of Yes, it was, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the other point you made in terms of uh, the need, I think, uh, to have an interdisciplinary focus, uh, yeah. I think is, uh, certainly expressed by some of our best thinkers uh, uh, in criminology today. Uh, no single discipline will do the job anymore as far as the complexities uh, of human And even behavior. within sociology, there are different specialties that apply in different ways to studying criminal justice systems, yes. particularly. Well, um, let me ask you a, another question. Um, I remember um, uh, you made quite an impression when uh, you were discussing methodologies uh, in criminological research and um, at the time you said the the simple statistics uh, sometimes are uh, tell you more than some of the uh, uh, more sophisticated numbers crunching do you feel that way today well i must say i like to see diverse approaches one checking on the other I did this little study of fines as against other penalties in the Los Angeles Municipal Courts, and it was a simple statistical study. And then we still had some money, and I had a good uh, graduate student who was, uh, I guess she had finished, she worked for me, Margaret Gordon, but she knew a lot more mathematics and statistics than I do, mm -hmm. particularly when I studied statistics to do a correlation, especially a multiple correlation, meant weeks in front of a desk calculator. Yes. <laughs> and now they do it with the computers in no time. At any rate, we she redid our fine study in logit uh, correlations, uh -huh. and uh, it was uh, more fruitful and more sophisticated. I had to talk a lot with her to be sure I understood what she was doing. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, I guess that the bottom line there would be that um, we've made enough progress as far as uh, statistical uh, approaches are concerned that we can now benefit from, from the more sophisticated oh, yes. approaches. Sure. Uh -huh. All right, let's uh, switch uh, uh, topics one more time. Uh, I know um, uh, you've been the president of the American Society of Criminology. Yeah. and. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that year? Well, I must say I'm not a, I'm not much of an organization person, and I haven't gone to meetings so regularly. I wait for them to come to me usually, <laughs> yes. unless somebody puts me on the program. And uh, when I became, I used to go to most to the American Correctional Association, and I got involved in the research in parole and the in fact the state sent uh, Lloyd Olin and me to the first professional meeting I ever went to on expenses when I still worked in Joliet prison to the ACA and uh, I kept going and interacting with correctional people and uh, I had heard of this small ASC but uh, mm -hmm. seen that little journal criminology but didn't uh, I, I read criminology in the 
major disciplines in the general criminal law, criminology. Uh, at any rate, uh, I uh, was made chairman of the department, as you know, in sociology, and then I had to give priority to going to sociology meetings, national and right. regional. Right, ESA. Uh, we were usually recruiting, and I had to go just for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got out of contact with uh, the uh, correctional organizations entirely, mm -hmm. uh, ACA, and I started going to ASC a little, and I had to go when they gave me the Sutherland Award, I, I started going more regularly and was nominated and elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't been too active in it since then, yeah. I must say. Well, like the Sutherland Award is the highest award uh, <laughs> one, one can give as far as a criminology, uh, criminologist is concerned. And uh, then um, I got the Volmer Award for Applied yes. Criminology, which yes. in some ways I like better. <laughs> really? That's interesting. Well, um, what about um, your uh, uh, future plans? What What are you doing Well, now? I'm uh, 77 and I'm retired uh, officially for some years in Meredith, <laughs> so I still have the title Senior uh, Research Associate in our uh, Social Science Research Institute and go to their meetings and look and give comments on grant uh, requests, things of this sort. Mm -hmm. I'm still writing. I have this uh, McGee book, which came to me uh, very suddenly in 1992. I, uh, John Conrad was supposed to write it, and he yes. died suddenly. Yes. And they asked me to write it, and it just came out last November. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, I'd already been working on a a different kind of criminology book. I took a title from one of our articles called Profitable Penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, after I had the realistic crime control, I've been revising it. But anyway, it, I have that. Whenever I taught, I sort of innovated and thought I didn't like any of the textbooks and I wanted to write my own. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, I've been writing them all my life, but I didn't publish much in those areas. Uh, of textbooks. And now I have this uh, Profitable Penalties, which is in with uh, Sage and uh, and uh, Pine Forge. I have to mm -hmm. see the editor there. And um, I also had worked on a different kind of sociological theory book. And uh, if, this, if I get this criminology book out of the way, I'll work on that. But, as I say, I'm retired, I do it for fun, mm -hmm. and I don't have deadlines, and that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> that, is, that must be a nice, <laughs> nice thing to do. Uh, this uh, um, Profitable Penalties, you say that's a criminology book? Yes. Um, do you get into theories? Um, I tried, I start out with a discussion, uh, with uh, essentially the goals of punishment, mm -hmm. and uh, I list about seven of them. And, uh, All the R's, retribution? Well, no, uh, no? Uh, revenge certainly is the first one. But, uh, and I have uh, uh, an incapacitation and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I call retraining. It's, uh, and uh, I uh, try to integrate the uh, criminology research and uh, knowledge of the criminal justice system uh, under these headings, and then I have a series of chapters on s separate patterns in crime, what I call adolescence transition crime, which is most crime, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the uh, criminal vices, essentially anticipating the trend, which I discussed. Yes. And, and then on uh, crimes of, uh, in, of legitimate occupations. And every le legitimate occupation has crooked ways of behaving, and it goes up from small employee pilfering to the biggest white-collar crimes. That's the yeah. most extensive crime yes. in terms of uh, losses to the public, certainly, both uh, even in humans from pollution as well as the property losses. 
And then I have a crime on violence where I get more symbolic interactionist in analysis of, of uh, aggressive and sexual expression of emotions in uh, illegal ways. Let's see, and uh, I may have these that, uh, out of the sequence. And uh, then I have professional crimes, which is a different pattern that some of you, uh, Hershey thinks are negligible, but there are certain kinds of crimes which uh, occur with, and we know from the seldom a prosecutor because they aren't caught. Fencing is a good example, mm -hmm. as well as the mafia, the organized crime, which is well integrated mm -hmm. with uh, catering to the vices. And uh, then I tie it all up together <laughs> and go into policing trends and so forth. Now, of, of uh, the various major strands, uh, theoretical strands, uh, symbolic uh, interactionism, um, differential association, differential identification, uh, control theory. Um, do you think at some point we are going to be able to combine the uh, most important strands of these? Or I think uh, that they were overly abstract, including my own writings, and uh, the terminology was vague, and they haven't been especially uh, useful in application. I think they're good broad perspectives and we, uh, they aren't as incompatible as we used to think when we were arguing with proponents of different yes. frameworks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of uh, uh, criminologists spend uh, quite a bit of time trying to uh, take pot shots at each other's yeah. uh, theories. I used to, but I got out. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't consider that a, a productive uh, avenue? Uh, well, I think it's good to be well-grounded and pertinent yes. uh, behavioral science frameworks, mm -hmm. sociology. You still need that for guidance in right. terms of where you're going. Uh, you know, when one looks at, the, at your career and uh, the many interests you've had in terms of narcotics research, or, uh, statistical uh, actuarial work, um, it is really amazing. It's a very broad career in the sense that uh, I don't think anyone will be able to pigeonhole you. Uh, you know, this is a person who, uh, let's say, specialized in corrections or uh, juvenile delinquency. You've done it all, haven't you? Somewhat, but mostly corrections. And mm -hmm. I've kept it, uh, doing a bit of that in probation and more than in prisons in the past decade or two. Would you say that that's your first love then, that, that particular focus? I think so. Mm -hmm. I know. Uh, the institutions, the agencies. I've known a yes. lot of officials from the, at all levels. Yes, from, from the very beginning. Yeah, I got that Ford Foundation project, which involved me in studying the federal parole and prison mm -hmm. system with an advisory board of the leading federal and state correctional people and working closely with mm -hmm. wardens and their supervisors. Well, given this, this focus and, and first love, you must feel somewhat distressed when you're looking at corrections today. Yes, I am somewhat. I uh, disagreed, and I, my last article was one of disagreement with someone I like very much, uh, well, not uh, small contact I have with him, Charles Logan. Yes. Uh, we, uh, yeah, this was in the, uh, I think, December 1995, uh, Justice Quarterly. I responded to an article a year or so earlier. I have to catch that. I yeah. have a, it, it escaped me. What, what did you tell in it? Well, essentially, his thesis was that we don't know how to reform people, uh, prisoners particularly, mm -hmm. and the uh, it's not the duty of prison officials to try to change, to re rehabilitate or reintegrate mm -hmm. offenders, only to provide humane punishment. And uh, I took it on, and he uh, he called me, and we had an interesting conversation. I think he <laughs> agreed with me on the facts, yes. but he thinks it's of it primarily as a moral issue. But I think if you can cost-effectively uh, reform with some programs, and if you do research to show what can be accomplished mm -hmm. and how, and if you had sentencing which focused on the offender rather than the offense, 
uh, we can, uh, if we can accomplish these things, as research suggests we can, mm -hmm. then I think it's morally our duty <laughs> to pursue that. Yes, I, I would agree. As a matter of fact, a fellow Californian, uh, uh, Ted Palmer, has uh, done, I think, uh, yeoman's work in the area of, uh, first of all, disproving the notion that nothing works. Yeah. And, uh, and showing us some ways in terms of uh, how we can do better research to prove w yeah. what does work. Yeah, he's, uh, he had problems with communicating to people who had <laughs> his own frame of reference with his somewhat private language, but uh, I admire and agree with him. Yes. Do you, do you see uh, any way out in terms of the mess that Corrections currently is in in any near future? I think that as long as we are very disturbed by crime, even though our crime rate is going down, more of the crime is with guns and by juveniles yeah. and violence, and the publicity, the mass media space devoted to crime has uh, in expanded greatly in the last mm -hmm. few years. As long as this occurs, there'll de be a demand for purely punishment, and the po politicians get uh, ratings uh, by expanding the uh, penalties uh, regardless of the cost. We're going to see, however, the cost as our prisons become geriatric institutions from the three strike laws. And uh, as always, it's not the severity of the penalty which affects the crime rate, it's the certainty. And the swiftness. Uh, and the swiftness, right. And we have neither of those two elements. <laughs> All right, uh, perhaps one, one more uh, question in, in the corrections area. One of the things uh, that, ha that uh, we have seen uh, recently, when you mentioned Logan, uh, that came to mind, is the idea of privatization of prisons. Well, I think that's uh, useful to have, like the TVA was proposed as a standard setter for regulating private utilities. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the private institutions have been, and services like privatized probation and so forth, uh, set standards to which, uh, which are competitive with the government ones. I think it's uh, been interesting and stimulating to have both on his work and those of others, uh, McDowell, I believe, show yes. that. McDonald. Uh, yeah, that uh, they often do better work at loss, less cost. Uh, the main thing is to have evaluation, and that puts, because there's a tendency to have the approach of Diulio that uh, as long as things are tranquil, mm -hmm. they're satisfactory. Yes. And, the, uh, and it's easy for administrators to, in prisons uh, to get into that rut. I saw a lot of that at Joliet, particularly with what's called the world's toughest prisoner. Prison when I worked there, but the focus was uh, purely on on keeping it uh, going and not uh, warehousing. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps uh, we might conclude our our interview by asking you if um, uh, what would you say to a, a young uh, criminology student today in terms of the field, uh, any particular advice? Well, I think he should uh, seek objective evaluation of the effectiveness of what he's doing for society mm -hmm. and for the organization and not get into the drift of uh, complacency and doing only what's convenient and what is politically uh, ex uh, rewarding. Expedient, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.